Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. For the past three years, they have been filming a documentary about heritage breed animals entitled The Holstein Dilemma, Heritage Breeds, and the Need for Biodiversity. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Hi, this is Alara. Welcome to this episode where we meet up with Steve and Anita Hill of Sunny Hill Ranch. Sometimes we find someone we'd really like to catch for an interview, but the logistics are a little more interesting than the average get-together. This was one of those times. Animal and people transport is not always an easy thing to arrange, but to try to get footage of an animal that might be raised in colder climates in settings that reflect this concept, you usually have to head north. In this case, way, way north. Steve and Anita are yak ranchers in the upper Susitna Valley, about 100 miles north of Anchorage, Alaska, and about 65 miles south of the highest mountain in North America, Mount McKinley. We met Steve at a conservancy conference in Williamsburg, Virginia. Aside from the fact that he was a really approachable guy and seemed like an interesting person, anyone who talks about frontier farming in a region with black and brown bears, moose, coyotes, wolves, foxes, and porcupines, a yak named Annie Oakley, and the challenges of farming in the most sparsely populated state in the United States, that's someone we want to get on camera. After meeting Steve, we went back to our hotel room that evening and started to do a little research on the yak. Based on that, we realized that our conversation with this guy could have expanded to add in the Himalayas, crossbreeding with cows leading to the bovine equivalent of the mule, the fact that the male of this species often wears a skirt, an amazingly high altitude tolerance, naturally low cholesterol meat, pretty much a lack of functional sweat glands, naturally odor-resistant wool, and butter tea. Yes, we did say butter tea. That's a real thing and just exactly what it sounds like. And not last and not least on the yak search done at 1 a.m. in the hotel room, we get to use the phrase bos grunians, or grunting ox. Pardon my Latin pronunciation there. That was Linnaeus, by the way, not us. It's apparently only used for the domestic version of the yak, as the wild ones are said to not like that. Okay, maybe that not liking part isn't actually the case, but they do say boss mutus, or mute ox, is the preferred name for the wild species. I don't know if the nomenclature committee asked the animals first before deciding that. We are sad and happy about the interview logistics for our meeting with Steve and Anita Hill. We didn't manage to hit Alaska yet, which we would have loved, and it's still not off the table yet. That said, the universe was turning in our direction for our meeting with the Hills and the Yaks, and it all worked out beautifully. Steve told us that the International Yak Association was having their winter conference at the National Western Stock Show in Denver, Colorado. This show is an annual event, and it's been around since 1906, held each January. It's one of the largest livestock shows in the country, and if you want a glimpse into what it was like when the drivers brought cattle to the railhead in the old days, go back to the old wooden stockyard pens and take a look. It's kind of like stepping back in time while standing in the present at the same time. Anyway, since we had plans to be there for the National Western already, that's what we did. Short of Tibet or Alaska, we felt like Denver in January was the next best place to see a yak. Sometimes life just works out well, I think. The wooden pens in the back of the stockyard were where Steve and Anita were showing their animals and meeting with all the rest of the yak people. So we worked our way back there. It was an interesting mix of sights and sounds and smells. We went past the front arena where the herding dog trials were going on, then past the stalls where the Herefords were being washed for an upcoming show. The Texas Longhorns were next on the right, and they also had judging and an organizational get-together that day. Then we saw the brightly colored Tibetan prayer flags flying and the vendor booths selling yak products, and we knew we were in the right place. I met my first yak by almost leaning up against it as I stood next to the pen. I don't know about all of these big animals, but the one I practically tripped over was standing really still, it was really mellow, and it looked like a big rug. I thought it was a display until it started chewing its cud. 
After I recovered, we found Steve and Anita, and you'll hear the rest. To bring you into the moment, when we had our interview, there were colorful flags flying overhead and the smell of straw and jerky in the air. There were moments where you could hear the warm exhale of a contented yak as he chewed his cud. You could hear the creak of the wood when people leaned on the fence to chat, and the yak people in the background explaining to an attendee about the various characteristics of the animals. You could feel a bit of the sun in a warmer than usual January in Denver, but a bit of the cold with snow still on the ground in some places. Yaks have been used for thousands of years for everything you might use a quad-purpose animal for. Milk, meat, fiber, and oxen. On top of that, the droppings are a great source of fuel for the people in Tibet, much like the Americans used buffalo chips as they crossed the plains on their way west. Yaks supply food through milk and meat. They supply textile materials for blankets, clothing, and hats. They're beasts of burden and plow fields. They supply fuel. In many ways, they're representative of the people and culture of Tibet. And in many ways, they're representative of the changes that are currently challenging all of the cultures and animals on this planet. We've evolved to meet the needs of a time and a place, yet we have to be agile enough to adapt to an entirely different scenario. Can a culture or an animal that is so unique adapt in time to our quickly changing economy and technology and climate, but still maintain the characteristics that make them fascinating and relevant and valuable? I'd like to hope so. And diversity in both culture and biology are critically important to keep the planet interesting and literally keep us alive for that matter. Enough philosophy for the moment and on to our podcast. By the way, here's a phrase you might never hear again, babysitter yaks. That and more in this episode of Agriculture with Steve and Anita Hill of Sunny Hill Ranch. If you would please state your name and your title if you have one. I'm Steve Hill. I'm Anita Hill. And we're yak farmers. So tell me about your farm. Uh, our farm is Sunny Hill Ranch. We're in, on Montana Creek, Alaska. We are 100 miles from Anchorage. And we're 65 miles from uh, the way the crow flies from Denali. So we can see out Denali out our front property. And we uh, are members of the Heritage Livestock Conservancy as well as the International Yak Association. I guess uh, uh, what's unique about us, or it may not be unique, but um, we live off grid. So we're not connected to a power company or a telephone company or a water company. And so we uh, live off of solar power and generator. Uh, we do have a water well and uh, we uh, heat our house with wood and I cook on a wood cook stove and I grow my own vegetables and I can them. and. Um, our, our kids and grandkids live up there on the farm with us and they're doing the same thing and learning how to do that. So we're passing it on to the next generation. Wonderful. Well, that's, that's a fair ways up. Tell me about the climate in Alaska. Alaska, we have uh, a good portion of our year is winter, usually from uh, October till late April. We have snow on the ground. Um, and then we have a very quick growing season, lots of, of sunshine and daylight hours in the, in the summertime. Um, pretty much it's light for 24 hours a day. The sun just goes below the horizon for an hour or so uh, at the solstice. And, uh, and so things grow fast. We grow uh, lots of grass and, and yaks take care of it for us. <laughs> they mow it. So are they, are they mowers or are they tearers? That's my understanding, you're either one or the other. You pull or you uh, mow? Uh, they pull, yeah, but not destructively. Right, okay. So, so did you raise other animals before you chose yaks? Um, no, this is kind of a, a, a retirement project for us. <laughs> um. So why yaks? Well, I saw one uh, up at Chena Hot Springs north of Fairbanks and uh, saw one across the field and I stopped the car, got out and looked at it and I said, what in the world is that? And so I did some research and uh, found out it was a yak and uh, very well suited to the climate in Alaska. Uh, they, they handle the cold very well, thrive in it. Uh, and 
They're a, a multi-purpose multi animal for us. Uh, meat production, very lean meat, fiber, um, yarn, uh, many different felted products can be made from it. Uh, they can also be a, a beast of burden, pull, pull a plow if they're trained for it, um, and uh, you can ride them. Do you milk yaks? <laughs> I have. Yes, uh, if, uh, if they've given up their baby or if like our, when our breeding, we didn't have a breeding season um, established. We had one that was born at nine below and the mom couldn't take care of it. She gave it up and so I milked them to get the colostrum. But I don't milk them to milk them for milk, but I do for babies. So your husband comes home one day and says, let's get yaks. Is that how it went and how did that go over? Well, we, we both, before we even met, knew that we wanted to have a hundred acres somewhere you know, and live, have a farm life. Uh, we couldn't find 100 acres, so we bought 320. Um, and uh, yeah, I was all ready. I it just, uh, I wasn't born on a farm, but I got there as fast as I could. So yeah, yeah, I had never heard of, I'd seen the yaks when we'd gone to Tina Hot Springs and uh, he started researching a good animal. They're easy on fences, they're quiet, and they don't, they're not smelly, they're easy keepers. Um, very efficient with their food conversion and each one of them have a different personality so we have a lot of fun with them. That's one thing we noticed in the ring while we were there that boy they are animals laden with personality. Yes. Tell me about the personality of a yak. Um, uh, we have an old grandma she's 20 years old uh, her name is Sarah and and she's not a bottle baby. Bottle babies are very friendly and that's what we started out with. Um, Grandma is just an uh, old yak, and you couldn't ask for a sweeter one. And she'll just walk with you. Um, you can mess with her babies and, and pick her baby up and go if you need to get her somewhere. Uh, we have the, the babies, they like to run and play, and, and they're into everything. They're curious like a cat. Um, the steers are, um, we have two steers that we use as babysitters when we wean the uh, babies off of the mamas. We put the steers in there so they'll have adult supervision, and they protect. They protect the babies. Um, the uh, butcher bulls that we have there, we try to keep them all tame so they'll scratch. And, and they're playful, but they're pretty lazy in the winter time. And the bulls are bulls, you know, they're not, they just kind of do what they do. In winter time they lay around and be lazy, in the summertime they want to visit their girls. So who runs the show, the males or the females? Depends on which pasture you're in. Um, we keep the females separate from the males, so there's a pecking order. And so the, the biggest female yak is our alpha female. Um, the bulls, of course, they are in their line. When the boys and girls are together, then the bulls are, bulls call the shots. Did you ever ranch with cattle when you do this? No. So this no. is a whole different ball game and just mm -hmm. everything's brand new to you. Yep. I've, I've worked with animals before and, and we'd go visit farms and we raised pigs and chickens when I was young. And I've messed with horses, but never with, you know, I've had a little experience, but not, not anything compared to what we have with yaks. Where did you get them? Did you run down, to, down, the, down the street? <laughs> uh, you don't run down the street anywhere we're at. It takes five and a half miles to get to the highway. <laughs> so, um, we, uh, Delta Junction, Alaska is where we bought our yaks. Uh, there's good herd up there. There's, there's two or three good sized herds in the state and uh, so there are some some breeding options for us but the uh, International Yak Association has been a, a wealth of information for us the breed association really uh, provides some good education for us. I would think that it was something as off the wall as a yak might be to many people that you, you definitely the resources that you can find are critical um, so, so what are the kinds of things that they did that would that helped you? Um, networking with people is probably number one. Uh, every year they have um, education classes um, during the, the last week of the of the Nor National Western Stock Show, and uh, they can cover everything from uh, halter training to herd health, um, marketing. Uh, just anything to help the the small breeder, help them help them with their business. 
Because that's what this is, is a business. So now, in, in, in breeding a heritage-free animal, one of the things that has been a recurring theme is the need to market in a niche market. How do yak farmers, ranchers, are you a farmer or a rancher? Uh, I think we're both. <laughs> yeah. We farm grass so the yaks can eat. There you go. So how do um, yak farming ranchers uh, find the, the niche that they need and what kinds yep. of markets do you need? That's the difficult part. You pretty much have to create your own market. You have to get out there, work farmers markets, talk to restaurants, talk to chefs, uh, and, and talk to people about your product. This is, this is very lean meat. Uh, it's not something you can throw on the grill and, and, and have a fantastic steak. You've got to pay attention to it, but it's very healthy. Uh, it's, uh... <laughs> it's lean, it's heart healthy, it has the omegas in it. Um, some people that may be allergic to beef or pork from the grocery store, uh, Yak has a different enzyme, so it's comparable. Like if they're not allergic to like moose or caribou or something, they could probably eat Yak. So, uh, stuff like that. So it's the equivalent of goat milk to a regular milk. It's different enough in characteristics yes. that yes. it is. Yes. Okay. Yes. That, that actually makes sense. Now, one of the things that the Highland people have said, the Highland cattle people, <laughs> is that because of the amount of hair on your animal, there's less of a layer of back fat. Correct. And the meat builds differently. Is that the same way? Yeah. Yes. 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 Okay. Doesn't marble. Yeah. They they lay their their fat on the outside of the carcass. Doesn't, doesn't marble the meat. So it's naturally lean. Yes. Okay. And if you add fat to your hamburger meat, nobody's going to buy it because they want the lean meat. So that right there is an advantage. Yes. Sorry. Yes. And people love their bone broth. You know, that's a huge thing. It's very, very nutritional for you. And uh, so soup bones, we sell a lot of soup bones. Yeah. Interesting. Well, we, did, we just went up and tasted the, the hamburger sample, I believe. Yeah. Very similar to beef, and yet it's got a really nice, interesting taste. There. Yes, sweeter. Yeah. Sweeter. And that's yeah. it. It's a sweeter mm -hmm. taste. Yeah. So why is that? Because of the browsing, or because of the character, the nature of the meat itself? I, I, don't, I, know. I don't know. It's delicious. Know. Though. It's just yeah. different. It's really good. Yeah. We also, I also comb the um, fiber off the yak and uh, either sell it uh, raw fiber to, we have a lot of spinners in our area, and so they'll spin it, or this year uh, we had a, a mill open up in Alaska, so I sent my fiber to her, and she did an excellent job uh, turning it into yarn. And so there's, you have to know your market, you have to know what's around you. Um, Alaska's a big tourism state, so it's something different to Alaska, but they're a cold weather animal, so we have a lot of people that are interested in, in knowing and also t for eating their meat and their fiber and you know doing their fiber. I could very easily see that we we had a farm that did ecotourism and she had horn dorset sheep and it was a big draw mm -hmm. for us because you get to look out and see this very interesting animal outside. I could see that it would be huge. Yeah, really really interesting. So tell me about about collecting the fiber and the different tines, the top versus the bottom. Tell me about that process. Uh, with yaks, they kind of have a three layered. They have the down, which is right next to their skin, which is the primo stuff. And then they have the uh, second layer is a little bit longer, and then their guard hairs is the longer stuff that they usually have around their skirt or on their mane or their tail. And um, each one of those serve as a purpose, but the down is what most people are sought, sought after. And um, yeah, it's warm, it's, it's comparable to Kavut, which is off of musk ox, another cold weather animal. Do you shave this animal or comb it? Um, you're better off to comb it out. If you shave it, it takes too long. And from the seminar we went to yesterday, uh, they don't grow their hair back the same way the next year. So it's better to, to comb it out. So how does one get the down portion if you comb? Well, the, the yak actually blows its coat. They shed in the springtime just like a, a dog does. And so I'll go out there and I'll see them licking each other and I'll know, oh, their fiber's coming loose. And I just go and brush them. They like to be scratched, so I just use that to my advantage. Interesting. So now I looked at these animals the other day and it looked like they have a growth on their belt of hair or something. And I was told that this is a specific thing to yaks that it sort of protects their underbelly. Is that right? Because it does look like they have a big, big belly underneath. But is that all hair? No, it's not all hair. Yeah. They, they tend to have very thin hair on their belly and that long skirt that they have is protecting them. It's kind of like an overcoat. Yeah. Um, but you get, you get on the belly and, and up inside the, the, the back legs, it's almost hairless. Yeah. 
They do have a light hair, they do get a light layer of hair, winter hair, on their udder region and stuff like that, and they actually do shed that, but it's very, very fine, and you wouldn't know that unless you had to milk the yak. So, <laughs> but if you, if you watch them walk through uh, the snow, you'll see a, a sweeping motion and then four peg legs, so. So they also have a full tail. Like a face. horse, mm -hmm. yep. Uh, and the most distinctive part of their tail is is when they have to run. I don't think a yak can run without their tail straight in the air. <laughs> we saw that in the ring and that's a crazy thing. It looks like an excited dog or an excited yep. horse straight up there. And that's a, so that's a characteristic of yaks. Yep. And another thing with the yaks that's different than a, than a, a beef cow is the fact that they will raise that tail out of the way before they go to the bathroom. So in that sense, they stay clean. I was looking at that and I thought, what an advantage that is for... Yes, and, but that tail seals their coat, it seals their skirt off, you know, so they don't have any drafts underneath there in the wintertime. But yeah, very distinct. So now this is, they, they, they I, I don't know what their gestation period is, do you know, it's like... 258 days. Okay. So they're comparable to, to other A little bit short, a little bit shorter than a beef vine. cow. Yeah. Okay. So do they have babies, do they gestate all through the winter and then have babies yeah. in the spring or is it the other way around? Um, it, we have our breeding season. Uh, from July to October and then we separate them for the winter time and so we breed to where the babies will be born in April. Uh, March is too cold, too risky of a weather so we start in April to have calves and usually have them April, May and sometimes into June. Because you've got to get them big enough by the time the winter comes around right. again two months later. And they'll, <laughs> the cows will cycle every month and if as long as they have good nutrition. Right. And so you pretty much select your breeding your, your calving season for what works for your farm. Right. So if you did not separate them, they would drop calves at any time of the year? Yep. Yeah, when it's nine below zero and you end up having to milk calves. Would they make it if they dropped a calf at nine below zero? They can. If mom gets, if it's a good mother and, and she gets on and licking that calf, it'll, it'll do fine. Yeah, the Highland people were saying that too. They said they've had, you know, in, yeah. in zero degrees, they've yeah. had calves drop and the, literally the licking is, is icing as they're licking the moisture yeah. is, and yet the calf survives. Yeah, they're very hardy animals. Um, I had one that was born uh, during the same winter, but he was born when it was uh, above zero and he did fine. And I, um, uh, he was so big that his mom was having issues. So he ended up being a bottle baby. He's now one of our steers, Pacquiac steers. But um, I put a calf jacket on him from our neighbors. He probably didn't need it, but he was out there with the other yaks at, at 19 below zero, and he did fine. And, and putting them back with the herd is the best thing that you can do with them, you know, even though I had to go out there and feed them. <laughs> so the herd's naturally protective over their babies? Yes. What behaviors do they exhibit? Um, we had uh, first, uh, the, when we first got our first half of our herd, uh, we had a steer uh, and he was the babysitting steer. So if mom wanted to go eat out of the swamp or whatever, sh you'd look out there and see a steer with this baby. So they watch out after each other. They will stay with each other when they're in labor or if they're sick, they will stay with each other. They're very protective of the herd. And the moms will take turns babysitting yeah. the group of calves. Yes. So it's a, it's a communal thing for them? It tends very, to be. Yeah, very much yeah. a herd animal, yes. Yeah. So, so how do you, do you think that this is the norm compared to, to their country of origin? Tell me a little bit about the country of origin. Uh, they're, they're native to Tibet, to the mountains of the Himalayan mountains. Um, and the Tibetan people are a nomadic people. And, and the yak that they herd, they're kind of a, a pastoral society, the yak that they herd are actually a part of their family. Um, mm -hmm. They don't they don't eat them. Uh, they won't butcher one for food, but when they die, they will take advantage of every part of that yak. It becomes their shelter, uh, their their tents, their their nomadic uh, housing is made from the yak. Uh, they. They will typically take half of the of the mother's milk, mm -hmm. and give the calf the other half, uh, and and they uh, make butter. Yak uh, butter tea. Yeah. Yeah. They, it, it's kind of a staple, yak butter tea. Um, but they they tend to control their yaks with salt. 
Salt is a very uh, scarce commodity in their environment. And so they're, they'll keep a bag of salt and those yaks have to have the salt and they will come every day to get, to get their little portion. Wow, that's a very, that's a very interesting thing. Yeah. Huh. The Tibetans use the yak just like the Eskimos and natives use the whale. They use every part of it and that's their survival. So the slow food architecture is something that we've been looking into a little bit. The, the animals that are so strongly a part of a cultural norm, uh, breeds of animals are, are included in this, I believe. Uh, like the Navajo churro sheep to the Indians in Arizona mm -hmm. and in Colorado. So I would assume that the yak falls into that category for the Tibetan people. Yes. Yeah, I, I believe that's correct. Yes. Well, they will they will brush their yaks also use the fiber to make them stuff to sell also to to for their income uh, the yak butter uh, also too they'll make that into a commodity for them to sell so how does this animal differ here or in Alaska than it, than it in its country of origin do you think they're spoilt rotten <laughs> we, we have a neighbor that uh, runs a trekking business and he's also a mountain guide a uh, mountain climbing guide in the Himalayas. So in his off season, he brings uh, a couple of Sherpas, his, his climbing guides, back with him to Alaska to be his yak wranglers. And they take a herd of yak trekking for tourists. Basically, they're beasts of burden. But they're, the, the Sherpas, when they when they come to our farm to pick up the yaks that are going to go with them, their comment is always that our yaks are fat, <laughs> there's too much grass. <laughs> their, their yaks have to forage for themselves, pretty much. And, and over here, of course, living in Alaska, we have to feed them during the wintertime. And then we feed them uh, other grain to you know, keep the protein content up in their diet. This is an animal that, that, that normally has to forage, but it really does not in your particular environment. Correct. Except for those four months out of the year. Because we have fences and they don't. So that would, that would say, I would assume that these animals are, that your animals don't get quite as much exercise because they're not used as pack animals, they're not forced to pack every day, or do right. you use them for that as well? No, we don't. No. Yeah, it's, they're meat animals for us, 90% of them. Um, and so yeah. we, we try to feed them well and grow them in a, in a, a, a careful way. Yeah. In, in Tibet, their metabolism goes down in the wintertime. It really shuts down to a low, so they don't normally have calves in the wintertime. They wait till it warms up and they have the grass and then, and then the breeding season comes. Um, we notice that their metabolism kind of slows down. They, uh, with the loss of daylight also, they, they just assume just hang out in the barnyard with the hay bale. So does this make them an easier animal for you to keep because naturally they kind of just slow down in the winter? Yeah. They are. Yeah. <laughs> winter is kind of a rest for us. <laughs> but it's not like a herd for the whole steam where it's 365 days a year, it's going to want air conditioning and this temperature range. No, no. They're very versatile in the temperatures. I mean, it's, it's hard on them when it, when it gets hot because um, we don't have a pond or a lake for them to go in, and if we did, they would be in it. Um, they'll find a shade and stay in it. If it's windy, they'll lay down somewhere out of the wind. Uh, if it's rain, their, their uh, fiber has a little bit of, uh, um, it's not lanolin, but comparative to it, so they shed the rain very easy. So unless it rains for a month solid, they really don't care. They just really don't care, and they, they're very adapted to the weather. Oh, really? now, I don't know if this applies to you or not, but one of the things that many um, many uh, ranchers or farmers with heritage breed animals, because they're such a small group often, because the, the genetic pool is widespread, mm -hmm. they use uh, AI and other techniques, you know, artificial insemination and other techniques to, to get stock from other places. Have you ever done that? And are, are yaks, are, that, is that, are they amenable to that? We have. This is, this is something that just took place this past year, um, because we we live in Alaska, we're, we're even a, more isolated than than the, the group of yaks that are down in in the states here. And uh, there's a, there's a, a farm, Springbrook Ranch, 
that is kind of pioneering some some AI for yaks and and uh, embryo harvesting. And because of our situation, um, they've kind of helped us out. Uh, they did a collection uh, and sent the semen up to us. And we actually did uh, AI on 10 cows this year. And we have four uh, confirmed. Two confirmed. Two confirmed, two but confirmed. four probable yeah. uh, pregnant cows from, from an AI. And, uh, which opens up new bloodlines for us. Right, yes. that, that's, a whole, so that's, that's a whole new bloodline for the state of Alaska. Right now, we're, we're, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to, to move yaks through Canada. Um, because of the disease regulations that they right. have coming down. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah, that makes yeah. sense. And I did, you didn't really think about it, but you, you, do, you don't have a choice. It has to go through Canada. Correct. On a boat. Well, there, right. That's the other option is uh, coming up the Alaska Marine Highway, which is a ferry boat up the Inside Passage. But that's very expensive, and, and it's a long trip. It is very expensive. Well, that's one of the things that occurs to me when you have to. When we were in Alaska, I was, it was probably in the 80s, I think. <laughs> And it costs $4 for a gallon of milk yeah. because of the shipping and whatnot. Right. And I don't know if, if the average person understands just how expensive it is to ship in and out of Alaska. Correct. But I would think that if a beef cattle doesn't make it because it's not quite in, as, as, uh, Correct. as yes. happy with living in that environment, this yak might be a perfect solution for both milk and meat. I mean, is Alaska adopting this at all? Not really. Um, the meat market is is growing for us, but uh, dairy, the the milk is the volumes are so low. Yeah, it's not like there. a it's it's not like a, a milk cow where you're gonna milk it and get to two or three gallons. I um, think you get a quart a day. Yeah. Out of two milkings. But it's very rich. Right. Very rich. So it's more of a beef animal if they were to use that type of option. Yes. It's a meat animal. Yes. Right. Uh, they. They're very efficient at converting feed. Um, they eat about uh, half of what a cow does. But we, our animals are a little bit smaller. Um, I look look for 900 pounds. Is that's my target rate? Target 900 pounds is my target butcher weight, and and we get there about 24 to 30 months. Interesting. So now raising these animals in your neck of the woods, mm -hmm. you also have other predators that we might not, it's not just a coyote you have to deal with. Tell me about some of the predators yeah. that you have. <laughs> well, we, we have uh, grizzly bears, black bears, wolves, coyotes. Um, those are, those are the, the things that can cause problems for us. Uh, we deal with that by using livestock guardian dogs. Mm -hmm. The yaks do not need a guardian. They don't like the dogs. But the dogs avoid the yaks and keep all the predators pushed back, keep them out of the way. And in seven years that we've been there, uh, we have never had a, a predator problem. And, and the dogs uh, do perimeter checks. And so like uh, we had a, one that uh, had her calf in the, in, the, in, a, in the back of the pasture that she was in. And I went down there to check on her, and the dog was coming back from her patrols, and she saw us in there. And so she came with us, realized there was a calf there, and so every time she did a check, she goes to check on, on that mama and that baby. She doesn't go in the fence, but she goes to check on them, because when you have, uh, the afterbirth does attract uh, predators. And so the dogs do perimeters just to check on those. Or if you tell them or show them that that's what's happening, they will do their rounds to check. I, the, the guardian dog concept was a mm -hmm. fascinating one that we learned in Colorado. They just yes. do their own thing and they right. don't. Right. They are not pets. Right. No, they're no. very independent. Very independent. And they, they resent your uh, <laughs> interference. Interference in their job. <laughs> No. But, but some of the guardian dogs, at least with the sheep, they, that was their family. They hang out with the sheep. They are, that, is, that is their unit. If yaks don't, um, don't, are, are not happy with that particular concept, did the dogs still transition well? Well, we, we deal with, we use the guardian dogs in a different way. They don't attach themselves to the, to the yaks, but they attach themselves to whatever they can find. We have one that is attached to the house. That's her place. She's an older not, dog. Not in the house, but uh, there's another one that 
prefers equipment. Follows the tractor anywhere it goes. If I leave it in the field, the dog stays there with the tractor until I go back and get it. Might be a day, might be three days. Um, another one. Uh, stays at the shop. Right. <laughs> stays at the shop or if the grandkids are there, we'll be with the, with the kids. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. So, so would you recommend this animal, if, if you had to say, you know, you're an, a beginner person, you're going to start out, would you recommend it or no? Sure. I would. They had if, land. And if you're prepared to uh, build some handling facilities. Yeah, that's you a need, good thing. You need a squeeze chute. You need some pens to be able to handle them safely because they're a horned animal. Um, a hoofed animal. And they, <laughs> yep, yep, we have to trim hooves. Yep. Um, but they can be dangerous. We, we work real hard at keeping ours tame. The ones that are ornery, we eat them, and they're delicious. Do you, when you, actually, that's one of the questions that I usually ask. When you, when you are, uh, have your calling program, there are many criteria that people use, that, that there are target criteria for what they want in an animal and what they don't want in an animal. Mm, and right. behavior is apparently a calling, a high calling priority. Absolutely. Is it the same for that? Yes, very yes. much so. Um, the honorier they are, the tastier they are. Yeah. Yep. You, don't, you just don't. And because they have hooves and horns, you just can't put up with the honorary one. Um, they're dangerous. And, and you can't have that on a farm. You just can't. So do you think that people in America know much about yaks? And how would you like to change that if they don't? Well, I would like every American to have a have some yak on their plate for dinner. Um, it's enough of a novelty that when when people find out that there's yaks around, they want to come see. And uh, during the summer, at least one day a week, we're given a tour on the farm. Or uh, people have family come up, people uh, come visit Alaska, and they hear that there's a yak farm there, and they they've never seen one. They want to come see. So you, one of the things that you were telling about earlier was the livestock conservancy and how you you were wanting inclusion in their list. Tell me why you think that you actually be included. Well, we fit one of their criteria of of what's called a land race breed. It's an isolated population. Um, yes, there's millions of them over in China and Tibet and India, but. The, the yaks were, came to North America around the term, turn of the century, um, various methods, some, some came to zoos, some were uh, 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 commercial projects, experiments for uh, crossing with cattle. And uh, so, so they've been here for a while, but we have an isolated population and, and we're, we're different because of that isolation, we're different from the animals that are in in Tibet and China. Um, so the conservancy would call that a land race breed. Uh, relatively small numbers, probably five to seven thousand. And uh, I would look to the, the Livestock Conservancy to um, help us with breeding strategies so we don't run into uh, inbreeding problems. A genetic bottleneck, as is, is the case with many. Do you feel mm -hmm. that biodiversity is important? Yes, very much so. Uh, we don't we don't have a monoculture. It, it takes many pieces of the puzzle for for us to uh, as people to live a healthy life, and uh, I think yaks are are one part of that. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe. This is how we keep going. And please tell your friends to join us. Please feel free to post any questions or comments that you might have to our social media sites. Our Twitter feed is at Backyard Green Films, spelled B-K-Y-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Instagram is at Backyard Green Films, B-A-C-K-Y-A-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Facebook is Backyard Green Films. Our YouTube URL is 
youtube.com Backyard Green TV. We want to thank Steve and Anita Hill of Sunny Hill Ranch for speaking with us today. If you'd like more information about their ranch, please visit their website at sunnyhillranch.com. And for more information about yaks, please visit the International Yak Association at iyak.org. You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. We'd also like to thank our producer, Michelle Council. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions, all rights reserved, copyright 2019.